have your Bibles, let's turn to Daniel chapter 9. If you don't have one with you, uh, we have some blue ones back on the back table. You're more than welcome to follow along with us. And if you don't have one at home, that's our gift to you. Take it home with you tonight. Uh, but in the last couple of weeks, we have been covering some intense visions that Daniel's been having in the last couple of chapters. And it's all been about the future of humanity. And oftentimes when we face things that we don't understand and we uh, struggle with, it, it's a perfect opportunity. What do we often do? We often fall on our knees and pray. It, it's that overwhelming. And uh, this, this week, the chapters we have been between are 4 and 5, but now in chapter 9, we're moving between chapters 5 and 6 in the book. Um, so again, remember the last six chapters are during his autobiography, during the first six chapters. So we're kind of going back and 10. So this is actually happening between chapters of 5 and 6. But when I thought about that, that we oftentimes fall on our knees in prayer because of overwhelming situations, uh, my mind raced this week to my son Silas, who's 5, who just had to undergo a procedure at Seattle Children's Hospital. Hospital. And it was the full thing. They had to go full anesthesia so they could put a camera down his throat uh, and do things because of his breathing issues. They were trying to find out what was going on. But I found myself really quickly absolutely terrified in the situation. Why? Because I had no control or power whatsoever to make sure my little boy was safe during that whole time, that whole procedure. There's nothing I could do about it. All I could do was I found myself driven to my knees to pray for mercy that God would bring my little guy through it. And it was a few hours later, but he did wake up before that. It was until he did wake up, I couldn't breathe a sigh of relief until then. Like I was constantly worried about him. But he did come out of it, and he's doing well. Um, but prayer itself is just simply speaking to God. I was talking to him about what I was going through, about what I was seeing and feeling, and just reaching out to him. And that's important because as Christians, having an active prayer life, actually speaking to God daily, is so important for our spiritual growth. If I didn't speak to my wife for a year, do you think our relationship would really grow? No, it wouldn't. She wouldn't be there. She would say, hey, it's been a year since you've even addressed me. Let's start back at the beginning. But to grow spiritually, we need to be in constant communion with him. And Daniel has modeled a prayer life all the way from the beginning, from chapter 1, even till now throughout the whole book, and especially chapter 6, when he faced, hey, if you're going to pray out publicly, what was going to happen? He'd get thrown in where? The lion's den, he took a stand for that. So it, it should be no surprise to us that in Daniel chapter 9, we find him what? Pray. He's a man of prayer. So let's begin at verse 1, and we'll read verses 1 and 2 together. It says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Osiris, by descent a Mede, who was made king over the realm of the, Chal or the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that, according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely, 70 years. So, Daniel was, we, we know him as a man of prayer, but even at the age of 85 years old, he's still being a student of the Word. He's going through his daily devotions, and in our book, we, we call it Jeremiah chapter 25. But in his days, it was a long scroll, and he had to read through that. But he's just doing his daily devotion, and Daniel sees this. He says, he perceived in the books the number of years. That, that books, what it's interpreted to be, it's, he's actually talking about the inspired word of God itself. That's what Jeremiah was to him, and that's what it is to us, as we learn in Timothy today, that it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. It was spoken about. Um, so basically, he's just in the Bible. He's just reading God's word for himself. And through that, God's word revealed the times that he's living in. And did you guys feel that over the last two weeks as we studied the last two chapters, the visions he's had, we realized the time that we're actually living in. We're, we're, we're wrapping things up. And this is probably where he was reading in Jeremiah 25, verses 11, 12. It says, The whole land shall become a ruin, talking about Israel, and a waste. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And then verse 12 says, Then after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. And then you go on um, in Jeremiah 29, it reads, For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. So remember, Israel has been in captivity for 70 years. Why? Because they were doing idol worship and they were forgetting the Sabbath year. They were not obeying what God had given them. So Daniel has realized, hey, it's been 70 years. So as a young 14, 15-year-old kid who was exiled in Babylon, he's saying, look, it's finally time. The 70 years are, are up. 
And the word of God, this prophecy, drove Daniel to pray. Because he realizes the time, what time he's actually in. I need to figure out what do we do now? Or what do I do in this time that we're living in? And he goes on to verse 3 and says, Then I turned my face to the Lord. And this idea in the, in the Hebrew here is that the purpose was, uh, and the word is, he's, he's going to the word and the word draws us to look upon God. It allows us to see him. It takes our vision off everything else that's around us, the exile, the punishment, the everything that we're going through, uh, just life itself. And what's it do? It redirects our vision to God. And that's what he's doing. Um, and it's a perfect model because Jesus was the word. He's, he's the living word. He's the living form of it. And what was his desire on earth as the living word? You guys remember? John 14, 9 says, Anyone who has seen me, talking about Jesus, has seen the Father. I came to show you the Father. That's what the Word does. It, it puts our minds and our hearts back onto Him. And that's why we teach consistently through the Word of God. So it doesn't become about us. It, it takes the focus off any individual and puts it on who? God. That's what it's all about. So again in verse 3 he says, Then I turned my face to the Lord, seeking Him by prayer, and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And the Word is just vital to our prayer life. Because it turns us to God in our prayer. It turns us to Him. And through the Bible, um, it just teaches us over and over again about how and what we're supposed to be praying about. That's what we need to know. And as we begin to grow in our knowledge of the Scriptures, we're understanding that prayer isn't so much about changing the situation as it is about changing our hearts while we're in the situation. It's pointing us to Him. And Daniel shows us here in these, in these verses uh, how to prepare for our time of prayer. And the first statement he said here, he said, turn, he turned his face to the Lord. So Daniel turned his face to the Lord. So the idea here, idea will be he was determined to get to the Lord. He was determined that nothing would stand between him and hearing from God. I am all in this thing. And oftentimes we get discouraged because of what we're going through, and we don't want to go to God because of maybe guilt, maybe shame. It could be uh, condemnation. It could be I don't understand who I am to God. Does he even care about the little, the little things I'm going through? He's a big God. These are, these, these are things that are trivial, but he cares. It says in Hebrews 4.16, 4, Let us then with confidence, everybody say that with me, with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So Daniel was bold. For a couple of reasons. One, he knew he was praying God's will. Why? Because he was in the Word. He knew what time he was in. He knew what to pray and how to pray. But he approached God uh, because of, of that uh, appointed time. He approached Him in the Word, and he had confidence in it because I need to go to God. He's, he's revealed to me where I'm at, and I'm going to go to Him in boldness. The second thing he talks about here in verse 3, he was covered in sackcloth and ashes. And that's just an old Jewish term, but basically what it is, it's a piece of uh, camel hair. And what they would do is they would wear it inside out. So when they were in their time of prayer and seeking the Lord, uh, the bristles from the inside of the hairs would rub on you, on your, on your skin. And it was just really what they were trying to do. It was just a practical way of trying to show that they're coming humbly before the Lord. They're humbling themselves, and they're, they're just showing humility. And that's what he's trying to teach us, that it, it's, it's an important that when we come to God, we come to Him boldly, but we also approach Him humbly. We have confidence in what He's done for us, but also in humility. James 4.10, our James said, if you remember this, he says, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will exalt you. Okay? Come before Him. So again, he's, he's coming to him in humility, but in confidence. The third thing he says, he came to him in fasting. And this is, this is just a practical way. This is why this is in Scripture. It's a practical way of just removing distractions. Why do we remove distractions? If you're talking to somebody in your home and the TV's running, you know, the Seattle Seahawks are playing, or if you're me, it's the Oakland Raiders, whoever it might be. Uh, but the game is on. Where's your attention going to be? It's going to be the focus on the TV or a movie that you want to watch. Are you really going to be giving all your attention to that person? No, you're going to be going, yeah, that sounds good, huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You ever had that conversation with someone? So, again, fasting is the ability to remove distractions. For Daniel here, he chose food. And remember, he chose food also in chapter 1. He said, I'm not going to eat of the king's court. I'm not going to eat the things that are sacrificed to idols. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to, I'm going to make sure I do not give in to that temptation. And uh, we can do many different things that we can fast from. Maybe it is the TV. We turn it off for a few days. Maybe it's some type of other entertainment or uh, excessive shopping. But it's just what it does is any form of indulgence where we feed our flesh 
It's restricting that so that we can have a clear purpose. And the purpose for fasting is to remove the external stimuli so that we can actually hear God in our prayer time. That's why we're doing it. We're focusing on Him, just like if we were sitting with somebody in the living room, we turn off the TV so that we could hear that person and the real conversation they're having with us. So Daniel, he came determined, he came humble, and he came completely focused in his time with God in his prayer. And all these things are practically so he can hear God clearly. So in verse 4, he picks it up, and he begins his prayer. He said, I pray to the Lord, my God, and make confession saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keeps his commandments. So after God's word has prompted him to prayer and out of his own preparation for prayer, uh, with his time, he he starts to, okay, I need to gain perspective though. Okay, I came, I, I prepared, I'm ready, I'm driven to it, but I need perspective on how to pray. And the first thing that he does is he says, the great and awesome God. So in his prayer time, the first thing he does, he recognizes God's goodness and greatness in his life. Now, remember, he's been exiled since a teenager for 70 years in Babylon. That probably took some stirring. You know, his friends got thrown in the fire furnace. He's been thrown in the lion's den. Um, He's had to face uh, two different kings saying, look, this is the way we're going to do things. He said, nope. This is the way I have to do things because my God is real. So, again, he hasn't had a pleasant life as much as Daniel is, a, is an upstanding, God, a godly, fearing man in the Bible. He's had a rough one. So he probably had to really stir this up and say, I need to remember the goodness and the greatness of God even where I'm at and being exiled in Babylon. And when he gains perspective, what he's doing here when he's saying this is he's putting God back where he belongs. He's saying, look, this all-knowing, all-powerful, all-gracious God belongs on top, above everything, above even the circumstances that I'm dealing with in life. And once God is there uh, and he's put where he's supposed to be, then we can operate under his authority the way we're supposed to be called to do. We can pray under his authority. We understand that he's in control. And we are to allow God to show us things from his perspective. So we're going to read quite a few verses here for a minute. So 5 through 15, we'll go through. It says, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your co- your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to the, our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Sounds a lot like the gospel we're talking about in the communion. We have, we're just rebelling against God. It says, To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame. As at this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to all of Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, in all the lands to which you have driven them because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame, to our kings, to our priests, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. Verse 10, And have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. Remember, he's remembering you were telling us, Lord, over and over and over again. This is going to happen unless we repent, unless we turn to you. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Look how easy it is. All they had to do is turn away from what they were doing and turn toward God. In verse 14, Therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works that he has done, and he and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord, O God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as at this day we have sinned and we have done wickedly. So a majority of Daniel's prayer right here is what? He's dealing with repentance. He's openly admitting his part in all this. He recognizes the exile, the problems of life that he's going through, that Israel's facing, is not because he's serving some vengeful God. 
it boils down to the problems are because Israel has been sinful. Israel is a picture of us today. We have been sinful. We have not listened to what God has called us to do, and he, they're being judged for it. And even though Daniel himself, remember, he's one of the very few people in the Old Testament that was never recorded a sin under his name. And what is he doing? He's identifying himself with the people. The first thing he said was, we have sinned. So even in the Old Testament, this is the Holy Spirit working through him and living through him. He's recognizing already a New Testament revelation. Romans 10.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is Daniel praying, and his heart is lining up. Look, you know, I, I've been an upstanding citizen. I've been a faithful follower, but I realize I've had a part in this. I've been just as sinful as everyone else, and we need God. And centuries before the Holy Spirit had Paul write this letter in, in Romans, he understood the truth that was to come, that we're all in need of him. And more importantly here, though, Daniel saw himself and the Israelites as one body. You know, he didn't say, you know, I'm following God, but these guys are not. He put himself as one body. And Paul would eventually teach that same message that we are all what? One body of Christ. We're all one believer or one uh, bride of Christ. And if we can only walk in this biblical principle as a group of, of believers, if we would walk in understanding, then what? If, if, if I broke my arm, would I just let it dangle there and just say, look what you did? What would be the first thing I would do? I would cuddle it. I would grab it. I would strengthen it. I would get it to a doctor that can reset it. I would put a cast on it. I would take care of it. Everything that I would do, the, the weakness that it's bringing me, I would do everything in my power to fix it. And that's what we're called to do as a body, that we don't turn away from hurting people or those who are weak. We rush to them. We come to their aid. We, the New Testament tells us that we are to carry each other's burdens, is what Paul says. We are to be there for each other. And Daniel, what he's doing, he's standing in the gap for the Israelites. Even though he's carrying the weight, even though it was just him and three other guys in the beginning that would not bow to the, to the image, he's still saying, look, I'm one of them. Only by the grace of God, it would be me. So instead of, pace, instead of placing blame, he's more interested in becoming part of the solution. Saying, look, it's time. It's time that we stand up. And the solution is to do what? It's to put God back on the throne. And that's what he's going to get ready to pray here. So after the word has prompted Daniel to pray, he's prepared his heart, he's repented of his sin, he, what does he do? He starts petitioning God on behalf of everyone else. Let me pray for them. I know where we're at. And will we cry out for each other? Will we cry out for our city? Will we cry out for other individuals and not just be focused on ourselves because of the circumstances that we're in? He's in the exact same circumstances that everybody else is in, but he's still walking faithfully because he had a perspective of where God was in his life. So in verse 16, he goes on to say, he begins to pray, pray for the people of Israel. He says, O oh Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from the city of Jerusalem, your holy hill, because of our sins and for, our, or, and for the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. So again, he's, he's teaching us a key to prayer here. He, he's praising him. He's saying, you, you have done all these things according to your righteous acts. He's, he's, he's acknowledging our need for him. He's putting God where he belongs. And he's realizing that without God, what would happen? We would remain lost. We would remain in exile. We would remain in deserving this judgment. But he's saying, God, act on us. And, he, and in, in humility, he leads Daniel to ask and not demand for mercy. He doesn't command God that, hey, this is what you said, now you need to do it. He said, God, I realize it, and what your word is saying is it's time to move. Bring mercy back to your people. Even though we don't deserve it, even though I'm part of it, bring mercy back to us. And, you know, we have some faith movements that teaches us that somehow we can command God to move if we have enough faith. He has no other choice but to do what we have asked him to do, that God is forced to do it. And really, if anyone in Scripture could have that ability among men themselves to command God to do something, it would have probably been Daniel. He was a faithful Jew. He was an upstanding prophet. He was a seer. He was a faithful follower from his teenage years all the way up to age 85. And he does not ever approach God that way. Not one time. When he prays, he asks God. He asks him, be 
merciful on us. Be merciful on us. Even though they deserved all of it. Even though they deserved every last year of that 70 year departure. He says, God grant us mercy. And he uses this beautiful, this beautiful word. Let your anger and your wrath turn away. Even though it's ours to receive, have mercy. Think about what Jesus did. He's, he's praying for Jesus and he doesn't even know it yet. Because what turned away God's wrath? What turned away his anger? The cross. It absorbed it. It took everything so that we never have to experience this. So God was hearing Daniel's prayer and saying, look, I am going to provide grace. I am going to provide mercy. It's just going to come later. It's going to come in the form of my son, and I will make it perfect. I will make it absolute, and you will not have to worry anymore if you will believe. And he goes on to verse 17 and says, Now therefore, O God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, O Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. So just remember how Daniel in the beginning, it was just like this. He turned his face to what? To the Lord. He was determined to hear from God. And so he asked God, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary again. Look this way, this way, saying, pay attention, look over here, because why? His city, Jerusalem, they're in Babylon, they're pro- prospering and having all these good times, but Jerusalem is laid wasteland. There's not even a brick upon brick on the walls right now. It is totally destroyed, it's laying in ruins. And I fear that a lot of the churches, a lot of the church bodies today, is a lot of us are laying in ruins. But the hope is that God has kept himself a remnant within the walls. He, just like Daniel, he has kept people who have stayed faithful and who have not bowed, and they are following Jesus and not religion. They are true followers. And just like this, that must be our prayer. God, would you turn your loving gaze back on your church? Will you allow these that have stayed faithful, will you put them back into leadership positions? Will you allow them to rise up again so that the church can look like it's supposed to? Will you do that? Will you allow your gaze to be on it? And I was thinking about this gaze when uh, Moses gazed upon the Lord. What happened? His hair turned brilliant white. He actually shined. And when he came down off the mountain, everybody knew that he had just been with God. And everybody realized it. Why? Because the glory uh, was just permeating off him. Say, you have just been with God. We can't even be around you. It's so intense. And that's what we need to be praying, God. Restore that gaze upon your church again so that your glory can be there. Because we don't ask for his glory out of selfish reasons. We ask for like what Daniel did. It's for one reason, that his, it's for his name's sake. God, restore your strength to the church. Use us again. And it should be the purpose for everything we do. The reason we parent, we go to work, that we love our neighbors, all these things is so that God's name can be lifted above everything else in our life. That is what we're called to do. And he goes on to verse 18 and says, Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. So here's just another secret to prayer. Um, it's, It's a powerful prayer life when we can understand that we come to him, we can come boldly on into the throne room, not because of what? Not because of our righteousness, that's what hinders us when we think about that. Well, you know what? I wasn't perfect this week. Do, can I still come? You know, I didn't really, I didn't get in the Word this week. Can I still come? And he's understanding this isn't because of our righteousness. We understand it today because we have the New Testament that Jesus purchased us. He put us in right standing with God again because of his, what he did on the cross, because of his righteousness. He gave to us in place of our sin and said, look, I will take your sin upon me. I'll take every wrath from the cross and you will never experience it. And all God will ever see in you is my righteousness. And you can come to him freely anytime. He knows without a shadow of a doubt, and that's what we need to understand today, that God no longer sees the sinner that we are. He sees his son, Jesus. And he says, come, you're welcome to come. He ends in verse 19 and says, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. So knowing the time that has, has come, that God is about to move in the situation, and Daniel's not bossing God around with these kind of rapid-fire requests here. Um, when I read this, I, 
I, I think about the games, because again, I used to be big in sports. I'm not as big as I used to be. Um, but it's like a fan cheering on a champion or a team. He's saying, look, I can, I can see that you're about to take this thing over. You're about to conquer all this. And Daniel's just excited that God's might is going to be on display for everyone to see. He's cheering them on. Go, Lord, go. Do this. Do this. Do what you're about to do. Because he senses in the spirit, God is about to set them free. He's going to make them a great nation again. And there are people in Israel that are called to live in such a way that every other nation knows that God is alive in Israel. And that's what we're to do today. The church, we are to live in such a way that God is revealed to everyone. Then they know there's a living God. And it's just like I look around these last few weeks and I watch God build our church. He's growing it. There's people that's not here tonight, but he's grown many more people. Why? Because as a body, what's happening is we're starting to realize and become aware that it's not about us. It's about him. It's about him growing it. So our prayer should reflect that excitement that, look, God is doing something special in gathering stones. And not just gathering stones, but the entire world. He's, he's moving again despite all of our imperfections. And that's awesome, because I know I'm full of imperfections. And the moment it becomes about me, we'll stop growing. When the moment it comes about you, we'll stop growing. But if our focus is on the cross and what Christ has done, and ushering people into that movement so they can meet Jesus, it will continue to grow. Charles Spurgeon quotes this about prayer. He says, Oh, that we might learn how to pray, so that God should be the subject as well as the object of our supplications. O oh God, thy church needs thee above everything else. A poor, little, sick, neglected child needs 50 things. But you can put all those needs into one thing and say that the child needs its mother. So the church of God needs a thousand things, but you can put them all into one if you say the church of God needs her God. We need him today. We need to realize that. And that's what made the difference. It wasn't that Daniel wasn't great because he just prayed. There are many religions that spend hours a day praying. It wasn't just prayer. It was his prayer life was an expression of his own need and his own trust in God. It came out through prayer. So prayers, without being rooted in the understanding that it's all about the shed blood of Jesus that covers our sins, those prayers are powerless. They have no power behind them. It's only as born-again believers with the understanding of what Christ has done for us do those, do those prayers carry power with them. That's what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. It's resting on His completed work. We understand it. And just like Daniel, let us become students of the Word forever. Never let us get old. Never let us get tired of it. Let us stay in it. And we pray through that, and we understand how to pray that God's will would be done. And that our salvation is secure because of what? What Jesus has done for us. Nobody, I love Romans 8, nothing created, not in heaven, not in earth, not in the sea, not in the sky. Nothing can take us from him once he's purchased us. He's already done that. All we have to do is say, we believe, we trust you. Here's our life, Lord. And that faith in Jesus will cause us to respond to God's love by doing what? He's teaching it over and over. By loving others. That's why we're here. And we need to be doing that until we grow old, just like Daniel. Let's pray. So we're going to do some meetings tonight. I was thinking about this this week. So this is what Paul says while we're here. What everything is about, what it's based on. He says, at this point in two feet, he says, And I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So why are we teaching you? Why do we remember this? It, it has to do with the gospel. I said, ask myself, what is the gospel? Are, are we proclaiming it in everything that we do? Are we, are we really talking about that? So um, I, want to, I want to celebrate what God did for us, what Jesus did for us in the cross. So the gospel is simply this, that we have this great creator God who created everything for us, to enjoy, but the main purpose of that was so that his name would be glorified, so that he would be praised above everything else. And as for you and I, we've done everything, every human has belittled that glory, and we belittled his name. We, we do things with the brain that he's given us and the water that he's given us to even breathe the words. We, we act like he doesn't even exist sometimes. In the past, the present, and even today, we still do that. And we don't acknowledge him for his great gift. Then, Simply what happens is because of our rebellion, because we wouldn't acknowledge him, 
he said, I have to judge that. I have to, if I'm going to be a just guy and a, and a perfect judge, I have to judge the rebellion. But what he did in place of us is he brought his son, he brought Jesus in the flesh here on earth to his life. Why did he do that? You know, all that wrath, everything that was stored up for our rebellion, for us, for the death of his son, it was poured out on his son, Jesus, that he was killed for us. And what does that mean? It means that we don't come in and we, we don't celebrate the religion, we don't celebrate all these things. We celebrate the work of Jesus on the cross. And that is what he did. So when God killed him on the cross, God also raised him from the dead. And that same power of resurrection that was in Jesus, that brought him out of the grave, that's the same power that flows to you and I today as believers. That's who we are. It's working us. It's sanctifying us. So when we come, we don't say, hey, you know what? I, on my own, I can get rid of my anger. I can get rid of my lust. I can get rid of my depression. I can get rid of my anxiety. I can, I can resurrect my marriage. I can resurrect my life. Because you and I, we don't have the power of life and death in our hands. But Jesus does. And that's what he came for. He brought that forth that we can walk in that resurrection power. We can walk out of what the scripture says the way that we can finish death. We can walk out of death itself. I think it's because of what Christ did in the cross. And that's what I want to do now. Take communion. I want to be like, it's the first time all over again. The first time you've heard that message, I want this to be the first time that it's coming on you. It's exactly what you can do for it. And that's what he did. The spirit is going to sound like we're not even going to have a word yet. I want you guys focusing on the message of the song that we're going to take you in just a little bit later. Um, the beef is just from the bread of the same cup, so we're not going to talk to each other. So we grab both, and we do that to remember that the body is broken for us. And I pray that the blood is still to cover all things. Why? So the same wrath, all that wrath that is poured out and broke you from the cross, has to be removed from the earth. Never have to experience the power of the earth. That's what he did for us. That's the gospel message. That's why I'm here to say it again. Not anything.